This hearing will come to order. Let me welcome you all to the seventh hearing for the Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee on East Asia, the Pacific and International Cybersecurity Policy in the 114th Congress. As always, I want to thank Senator Cardin for his cooperation and support for holding this important hearing. He's got a busy job on this committee, and it is much appreciated. Uh, this committee has done a great amount of work on North Korea. Thank you to Senator Menendez, uh, Senator Cardin, uh, and uh, my colleagues, all of us, uh, for the work that we've done on North Korea. North Korea just conducted its fifth nuclear test, which is the regime's fourth since 2009. It's the regime's second test this year and the largest weapon they have ever tested yet, with an estimated explosive yield of 10 kilotons of TNT. The rapid advancement of North Korea's nuclear and ballistic missile program represents a grave threat to global peace and stability, and a direct threat to the United States' homeland in the immediate future. While failure to stop Pyongyang has been a bipartisan venture over the last 20 years, this administration's policy of strategic patience, crafted under Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, has resulted in the most rapid advancements in North Korea's arsenal of mass destruction. As the Washington Post editorialized on February 9, 2016, President Obama's policy since 2009, strategic patience has failed. The policy has mostly consisted of ignoring North Korea while mildly cajoling China to pressure the regime. We are now witnessing the consequences of that failure. Nuclear experts have reported that North Korea may currently have as many as 20 nuclear warheads and has the potential to possess as many as 100 warheads within the next five years. The Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper, has stated in his testimony to Congress that North Korea has also expanded the size and sophistication of its ballistic missile forces from close-range ballistic missiles to intercontinental ballistic missiles and is committed to developing a long-range nuclear-armed missile that is capable of posing a direct threat to the United States. This regime is one of the world's foremost abusers of human rights and maintains a vast network of political prison camps where as many as 200,000 men, women, and children are confined to atrocious living conditions and are tortured, maimed, and killed. On February 7, 2014, the United Nations Human Rights Commission of Inquiry found that North Korea's abuses constituted a crime against humanity. We also know that Pyongyang is quickly developing its cyber capabilities, as demonstrated by Sony Pictures hack in 2014 and the repeated attacks on the South Korean financial and communication <laughs> systems. According to a recent report by the Center for Strategic International Studies, North Korea is emerging as a significant actor in cyberspace with both its military and clandestine organizations gaining the ability to conduct cyber operations. So given the record of aggression from North Korea and the fecklessness of this administration's policy, this Congress came together on February 10, 2016 to pass the North Korea Sanction Policy and Enhancement Act. This legislation, which President Obama signed into law on February 18, 2016, was a momentous achievement. The first time ever Congress imposed standalone mandatory sanctions on North Korea. This legislation was also an implicit recognition from the administration that strategic patience has failed and it was time for a new policy of strength. Now that we are more than six months out from the Enhancement Act becoming law, I hope to hear from the administration today regarding its record of compliance with the law. We know that nearly 90 percent of North Korea's trade is with China. And I also hope to hear today from our witness a detailed ex examination of the People's Republic of China's record of compliance with UN Sec Security Council resolutions regarding North Korea whether Beijing has utilized any loopholes to avoid faithful compliance and what the United States has done about it. Sanctions, however, are not the only tool in our arsenal to deal with Pyongyang. First and foremost, we must reassure our allies in South Korea and Japan that aggression against our allies will result in unwavering diplomatic and military support from the United States. As Secretary Ash Carter stated on September 9, 2016, to his Republic of Korean, its Korea counterpart, the United States and the Department of Defense are standing guard 24-7 to deter and defend against the North Korean threat with all aspects of our extended deterrent capabilities, including conventional capabilities, missile defense, and the nuclear umbrella. We must repeat these assurances often to our allies and back them up with actions. We must continue with the show of force exercises near North Korea to demonstrate to the regime that it will, be, it will bear a heavy price for any aggression. The B-1 nuclear bomber overflights last month were a good start, and it is my hope that these actions will be consistent and unambiguous in their intent. We must expedite the placement of Terminal High Altitude Area Defense, or THAAD, in the Republic of Korea, and I want to thank our partners in Seoul for their decisiveness and commitment to this critical capability, especially in light of the pressure from Beijing on Mo and Moscow. We must strengthen and build a genuine and lasting trilateral alliance between the United States, Seoul, and Tokyo. There have been encouraging signs, including closer high-level diplomatic consultations and even joint missile defense exercises. I thank both Seoul and Tokyo for wisely pursuing this path of, of uh, cooperation and partnership. 
We must also explore possibilities for asymmetrical actions to put additional pressure on the regime, such as the redesignation of North Korea as a state sponsor of terror, stripping Pyongyang of its United Nations seat, or imposing a genuine and enforceable global trade embargo on Pyongyang. The gravity of, North Korean threat of the North Korean threat necessitates these conversations, both to guide the actions of this administration as well as to set parameters for the next administration. With that, I yield to my good friend and colleague, Senator Gardner. Well, Senator Gardner, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for uh, calling this hearing. It's been a pleasure to work with you during this Congress on this subcommittee. And uh, clearly, North Korea presents one of our greatest challenges. To our two witnesses, I thank you. Uh, I know that we had to adjust schedules, and I uh, thank you very much for um, uh, being willing to be here today to, to share uh, your vision as to how we can be more effective in regards to our policies concerning North Korea. This committee has taken action, as the Chairman has indicated, and Congress has passed legislation giving additional tools to the administration to deal with the activities of North Korea, including its most recent tests. The United Nations has taken action. They have passed uh, Security Council Resolution 2270. And it was our hope that China, working with the Republic of Korea, the United States, Japan, and others in the international community, that we would be able to put sufficient pressure on North Korea to change its behavior. That has not happened. So despite all of our efforts, the current policy is not deterring North Korea's activities in acquiring greater nuclear weapon capacity. So the question today is, what more do we do? How can the administration, working with Congress, provide the leadership internationally to change North Korea's activities? We know we need to have more effective action by China. What will it take to get China to really exercise the leverage it has over North Korea to change that behavior? North Korea's current trend presents not just a security challenge to the Korea Peninsula, not just a security challenge to that region of the world, but directly to the United States. What plans do we have in order to protect the security of our allies as well as our own security as a result of North Korea's activities? These are questions that we want to explore today. And we have two incredibly talented people who have given the public service over a long period of time. We thank both of you for that. And we look forward to sharing your observations as to what we can do to prevent North Korea from destabilizing its, that region and presenting a security threat to the United States. Thank you, Senator Cardin. And again, thank you to the witnesses for being here. Uh, I would ask our distinguished uh, witnesses to keep their oral remarks to no more than five minutes. Your full remarks will be entered into the record. Our first witness is the Honorable Daniel R. Russell, who serves as the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs. Uh, Mr. Russell. Chairman Gardner, Ranking Member Cardin, members of the subcommittee, thank you for holding this very timely hearing on North Korea, and thank you also for your consistent uh, bipartisan support of uh, U.S.-Asia policy. The threat from North Korea's nuclear and missile programs has posed a serious challenge to the last four administrations. Today, we are using all of the tools at our disposal, including tools that the Congress has made available to us to counter that threat and to roll it back. Our, stra our strategy is based on deterrence, on diplomacy, and on pressure. We deter North Korea through a strong defensive military posture rooted in our alliances with South Korea and Japan. And we've strengthened our alliances and our defense cooperation with both those countries to an unprecedented degree. We have expanded our deployments, our exercises, and our weapon systems in order to meet the growing threat. Diplomatically, we've united the world so that North Korea is denied regular access to the international system, so that North Korea is isolated and is widely condemned. But at the same time, we continue to make clear 
to the north that we're ready at any time to engage in credible negotiations on denuclearization and to offer a path to security, to prosperity, respect, a path that others like Burma have chosen to take. The third component of our strategy has been pressure and the tremendous pressure that we've applied through both multilateral and national sanctions has generated serious headwinds for the DPRK regime and significantly impeded its ability to generate desperately needed hard currency, to proliferate arms or nuclear material, to attract international investment or economic assistance, or to extract concessions and aid from the outside world. Together with our partners in response to the latest nuclear and ballistic missile tests, we will develop a new UN Security Council resolution that squeezes North Korea even harder. Together we will expand and coordinate our unilateral sanctions and impose escalating costs on North Korea until it agrees to negotiations on denuclearization and to comply with its international obligations and commitments. Together, we will shine a light on the egregious human rights violations uh, and push for accountability by the DPRK's leaders. Together, we will defend ourselves and our allies against North Korea's threatening behavior and make clear that there is a high price to pay for provocations. Mr. Chairman, our strategy has ensured that Kim Jong-un has nothing to show for his intransigence. Yes, he's made holes in the ocean with missiles. Yes, he's detonated nuclear devices in holes in the ground. These are bad things. But it has netted him nothing in terms of what North Korea has indicated that it needs respect, security, economic support, diplomatic recognition. He has failed to extract material or political benefits from his threats. As President Obama has made clear, we will not reward bad behavior and we will use all the instruments of national power to defend our homeland and our allies against threats from North Korea. It may well be that negotiating an end to his nuclear program is the last thing on earth that Kim Jong-un wants to do. But if so, we're determined to show him that denuclearization is the only viable option available, that only negotiations offer him a pathway out of danger and isolation. So I thank the committee for your attention to this critical challenge and uh, with your permission would uh, turn to my colleague, uh, Dan Freed. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Russell. Our second witness is Ambassador Daniel Freed, who serves as coordinator for sanctions policy at the State Department, a position he has held since January of 2013. Uh, prior, Ambassador Freed served in various distinguished positions, including as Assistant Secretary of State for European and European Affairs, as Special Assistant to the President, and Senior Director for European and Eurasian Affairs at the National Security Council, and also as United States Ambassador to Poland. Welcome, Ambassador Freed, and thank you for your service. Look forward to your testimony this morning. Thank you, Chairman Gardner, Ranking Member Cardin. I'll continue where my colleague left off. Sanctions are a key component of our strategy, and the sanctions applied to North Korea to date have created significant problems for the regime. Because sanctions work over time as their impact accumulates, the administration, in close coordination with key allies, is examining our sanctions toolkits and identifying ways to improve their efficacy. We're working through the UN with our allies and nationally. And this year has been a year of intensifying pressure in all three areas. Security Council resolutions play an important role because they have the power to impose universally binding sanctions. The five previous Security Council resolutions on North Korea between 06 and 2013 targeted North Korea's missile and nuclear programs. They did what they did, but their targets were narrowly focused. 
In March 2016, after the January 2016 nuclear test, UN Security Council Resolution 2270 imposed for the first time measures targeting economic activities generally that supported the Kim regime broadly, not just revenue streams directly connected to nuclear and ballistic missile programs. This was the first time the UN, with the support of all the Security Council permanent members, including China, took this step. That crossed a line in a good way. In addition, Congress and the administration, after the Jan especially after the January 2016 nuclear test, work together to adopt broad domestic authorities that operate on the principle that we must go after the revenue streams that support the North Korean regime. In sanctions, as the, say the saying is, as used to be said in Washington, follow the money. The North Korea Sanctions and Policy Enhancement Act was signed by President Obama. We have, we have vigorously used its principles and requirements. The administration has implemented the act, including by designating Kim Jong-un himself. Most recently, on September 26th, the Treasury Department designated four Chinese nationals and one entity complicit in, in sanctions of Asian activities, consistent with the mandatory sanctions in the act. That was a significant and hopeful, hopefully effective step. Working with our partners and allies around the world, especially South Korea, Australia, and Japan, and increasingly the European Union, we are, we are encouraging and pushing, when necessary, third countries to curtail their own economic ties with North Korea. We've had some good results. We have essentially shut down the operations of North Korean uh, Mar Ocean Maritime Management Company, its shipping line. We've restricted the landing privileges of Air Corio. Several governments around the world have imposed visa restrictions on North Korean passport holders. South Korea closed the Kaesong Industrial Park in February 2016. Taiwan has halted its imports of North Korean coal. There's more, there's more to say about this. But there is also more to do. China is by far North Korea's major economic partner. And North Korea's coal exports, mostly to China, generate over a billion dollars in revenue for the regime annually and account for about a third of all North Korean export income. We are working to curtail North Korea's ability to export coal and iron ore and limit its foreign currency earnings. We're also looking at North Korea's export of labor, which provides a source of revenue for the regime. Secretary Kerry affirmed last week at the UNGA that every country has a responsibility to vigorously enforce UN sanctions so that North Korea pays a price for its dangerous activities. We intend to pursue a global pressure campaign on North Korea more generally and to urge, where necessary, push other countries to join that effort. And I look forward to discussing this further with you. Thank you, Ambassador Freed. We'll begin uh, the questions. Uh, I commend the administration for finally designating a Chinese entity and four Chinese individuals this week, as you mentioned in your opening statements uh, this week, for North Korea's sanctions violations. I do wonder, though, if these designations would have taken place without the studies, the groundbreaking work, uh, released by the Center for Advanced Defense Studies uh, and the Asian Institute for Policy Studies that publicly identified these very same entities and networks and received widespread media coverage. Had it, would it not have happened without those studies? Regardless, it's my hope that this action will send a strong message to Beijing and to all of Pyongyang's enablers. It's also important to see the change in the administration's work and policy as a result of the heavy involvement from Congress, beginning with the enhancement act passage and continued oversight. This round of designations, though, should only scratch the surface of the eligible violators. In a new study called Stopping North Korea Incorporated, Harvard and MIT researchers found that the North Korean state trading company's uh, managers have shifted their strategy by one, hiring more capable Chinese middlemen who can more effectively handle financing, logistics, 
and doing business with private Chinese firms and foreign firms operating in China. Number two, taking up residence and embedding themselves on the mainland, which increases their effectiveness. Number three, expanding the use of Hong Kong and Southeast Asian regional commercial hubs. And four, increasing the use of embassies as a vehicle for procurement. It's my hope that State and Treasury are carefully reviewing the recommendations from both studies and taking appropriate action and strategy adjustments. Ambassador Freed, on September 16th, 19 members of the Senate sent a letter to the President, and I ask, uh, I'll, I'll insert this into the record, uh, but I'm going to start with some questions from this letter sent to the President. Uh, so, uh, Ambassador Freed, how many investigations are active and currently ongoing pursuant to the North Korea Sanctions and Policy Enhancement Act? We are current, to my knowledge, in providing the mandatory reports in that act. That is, we've sent up all of them that were required to do so. And um, frankly, we uh, appreciate the opportunity. The administration and the Congress are moving in the same direction. And the degree to, to the degree we send a signal of a united American position, the stronger we all are. So honest, I thank you for that. Um, Treasury Department, State Department are active in pursuing a number of potential North Korean targets. We are working, my Treasury colleagues are working diligently and may I say aggressively in tracking down violators of sanctions, both UN sanctions and American sanctions Parts of the State Department, particularly my colleagues who work on nonproliferation, have their own stream of activities and investigations. They follow arms shipments, they follow ships, they do this in great detail, and I can assure you that they are aggressive. I can't give you a number of specific um, investigations, but there are a lot of them. We follow both public material, you mentioned one, there are others. We also use intelligence information. Uh, we are in a forward-leaning mode. And how many of these uh, these investigations are taking place are of Chinese entities or uh, individuals? I don't want to get into specific numbers in this session, but let me say this, because it's a it's an important question and comes to the heart of the matter. It would be best if China itself came to the conclusion that it needed to put increased pressure on the North. China has, my colleague knows this better than I do, but China has expressed concern about and opposition to North Korea's nuclear testing especially. So the best option is if China does this itself. It would also be useful if Chinese banks and companies understood that increasingly dealing with North Korean companies, especially those that are sanctioned, is going to be risky, frankly not worth it. The best sanctions are those that do not have to be applied because they're the threat, the credible threat of sanctions acts as a deterrent. Treasury's action, well, the U.S. government's action earlier this week demonstrates that we are in earnest. And I can assure you that we are. There is more we could say in a classified setting, but I think you understand the direction that we're headed. Let me just uh, answer this before I turn to Senator Cardin, ask this before I turn to Senator Cardin. Uh, maybe a simpler way to ask it is, uh, are additional Chinese firms under investigation? We are investigating, Treasury and State are investigating a number of companies around the world. I'll put it this way, there are no limits and there is no administration red line of exempt countries or companies. We go where the evidence takes us. And so I, I think the answer is yes, additional Chinese firms are under investigation. Is that? I wouldn't argue with you. Thank you. Senator Cardin. Well, once again, thank you for, for your testimony and for your service to our country, both of you. Secretary Russell, I agree with you that we have done a lot. 
in leadership on imposing global sanctions against the regime in North Korea. And it has had a major economic impact on North Korea. There's no question about that. But it hasn't worked. It hasn't worked. North Korea continues to accumulate rich materials. It continues to nuclearize weapons. It continues to develop delivery systems that could threaten not only the region but the United States. Ambassador Freed, you mentioned countries that have been very helpful to us, and we appreciate what Australia is doing and the Republic of Korea is doing and Japan is doing and Canada is doing, and now you mentioned even EU. But it was notable that you did not mention China in that list of countries that are going beyond the UN resolution. In fact, China appears, uh, China appears to look for ways to weaken the impact of the Security Council resolution. We know about the livelihood exemption. You mentioned coal exports. Uh, you mentioned how dependent North Korea is on the, on the exports of, of coal. But this is perplexing because China does not want to destabilize the Korea Peninsula and does not want North Korea to have its nuclear arsenal that it has and is growing. And it could do so much more. It could. So what can the United States do? I asked both of you. What can the United States do to get China to take the steps it could take that will put the type of pressure on North Korea that they will change their behavior in regards to their nuclear program? Well, thank you, uh, Senator Cardin. Um, I first started working on North Korea 25 years ago under the George H.W. Uh, Bush uh, 41 administration and uh, have a healthy appreciation of the challenge that's faced for successive administrations uh, dealing with North Korea and motivating China uh, to cooperate with us. Uh, the difference between uh, 25 years ago and today is dramatic. The difference between eight years ago and today is dramatic in terms of uh, the extent to which China has begun cooperating with the United States in an effort to uh, freeze, roll back, and eliminate North Korea's nuclear and missile but don't program. you agree that China could very easily put the type of pressure on, nor pressure on North Korea that would change the equation here? We all know we certainly agree that a change in China's behavior is a prerequisite for getting a change in North Korea's behavior. That China has potentially tremendous leverage over North Korea, even so though what it can has we relatively do to get China to move? What can we do to get China to move? Well, first, uh, unfortunately, North Korea's actions uh, and increasingly egregious behavior uh, which we don't like, is generating a change in China's behavior. I what we're seen, doing... What, what, what have we seen that indicates China is changing its fundamental position in regards to North Korea? Well, Coal exports are up, aren't they? China is changing its behavior, not necessarily its fundamental position towards North Korea. And that behavior is manifest in its cooperation with the United States in trying to stem proliferation, in trying to enforce... Resolution 2270, and in creating but, barriers to the North Korea. Well, when you had the livelihood exemption being interpreted a way that Nor uh, China is interpreting it, it is a loophole that effectively takes China out of the equation when it comes to putting pressure on North Korea. And without Chinese pressure, we can have the strongest possible sanction regime globally. North Korea is protected. We, we fully agree that um, placing uh, restrictions on China's ability to export coal to China or anywhere else is a priority and it's a focus of the negotiations that are currently underway over a new UN Security Council resolution. But uh, is, is it correct that China's exports, North Korea's exports to China have grown? by 27, I have 27 and a half percent by value in August, making it the sharpest increase. They're not only not helping us, they're, they're 
they're helping North Korea, aren't they? We believe, and President Obama, after meeting with uh, President Xi Jinping, in which he had a very, very direct and forceful exchange on the DPRK and sanctions policy, said publicly that China can and should do more to tighten sanctions. This is a goal of U.S. diplomacy. This is only one facet, however, of China's uh, behavior vis-a-vis -vis the DPRK. And there are significant improvements in China's cooperation with the U.S. and the Republic of Korea in both implementing the 2270s UN sanctions and in uh, pushing back against the risk of either provocations or proliferation. Well, that's a pretty general statement, and I would like to drill down on it, and I will ask that you get us our committee information on how China has been so helpful. But it seems to me that because of its economic relationship with North Korea, its economic relationship with North Korea, that all the work we're doing on sanctions globally is being compromised dramatically because of China's economic relationship with North Korea. That we, doesn't seem to make any sense. We share the concern, Senator, that China's purchases of coal and other economic activities uh, create a lifeline that reduces the impact of global sanctions. And we are working directly with the Chinese senior leadership to encourage and persuade them to tighten up and to toughen up uh, for the purpose of bringing about a change in the DPRK's behavior. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Carter. It's hard to believe that China is serious about affecting change in North Korea's behavior when they continue to share a billion dollars worth of coal exports. Uh, and continue to share 90 percent of their economy. And I, I think Senator Cardin, what he, what he was getting at was Chinese cooperation. And are they going to be willing in this new security resolution that you're talking about to narrow or limit the livelihood exemption in the new Security Council resolution that you mentioned several times now? Uh, we, that's what is under negotiation now. Uh, we certainly hope so, and we're working to that end. At the same time, we are pursuing law enforcement cooperation, other forms of sanction enforcement and implementation uh, in an effort to continue to tighten the, the net on the DPRK for the purpose of changing their behavior and bringing them to real negotiations. Well, perhaps we can get further into this. Senator Brasso. Well, thank you very much, Senator Garner, for Mr. Chairman, for holding this uh, this hearing. And, and uh, to Senator Cardin, I think you're absolutely right on all of the issues that, that you've raised. I mean, I think about you know, what's happening. I look at September 9, 2016, Defense Secretary Carter discussed the most recent nuclear test by North Korea. He says, quote, China has and shares important responsibility for this development and has an important responsibility to reverse it. He goes on and he says, and so it's important that uh, it use its location, its history, its influence to further the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and not to direct things, uh, not the direction things have been going. So I ask you, uh, Assistant Secretary Russell, is China willing to impose any consequences, any additional sanctions against North Korea for this most recent nuclear test? And what specific actions, uh, specific actions, because as uh, Senator Cardin said, you know, we hear kind of general answers, what specific actions has the administration asked China to take in response to these nuclear tests and the missile launches? Thank you, Senator. Uh, I agree 100 percent with what Secretary Carter said. Uh, the President has met uh, repeatedly with President Xi Jinping over the course of 2016, as recently as uh, early this month in Hangzhou, China, and very forcefully presented our specific asks and recommendations in terms of practical ways that China can uh, inf enhance the effectiveness of sanctions, through border controls, through limiting access to Chinese banks, through uh, limits on air choreo and other modes of uh, transportation, shutting down uh, North Korea's cyber uh, bad actors, including on Chinese uh, servers and soil. Uh, the list goes on. President Obama met again in New York last week with uh, Premier Li Keqiang and again 
uh, pushed very forcefully. We have both a strategic and economic dialogue uh, in which Secretary Kerry uh, with his counterpart, the State Counselor of China, uh, have delved into this. Uh, and at every level uh, below that, we have uh, worked directly with China to enhance and improve their cooperation and their implementation. I, we are not fully satisfied. There is much more that we believe China uh, can and should do. Uh, we look for ways to demonstrate that it is very much in China's interest uh, to do more. And we have demonstrated, including through the decision to deploy the THAAD system, that the United States and our allies will take the steps necessary uh, as a, to protect us against the threat posed by the DPRK, even when those steps are unwelcome uh, by the Chinese. Uh, we've pointed out that the solution to their concerns about the behavior of U.S. military in Northeast Asia is for them to act more assertively in uh, changing the DPRK's behavior and ending the missile and nuclear programs. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, what we heard is that the President, as I think you said, pushed forcefully, but has not been very effective. So I want to talk specifically about trade between China and North Korea. Uh, and Ambassador, you may want to weigh in on this. Uh, China is North Korea's largest trading partner. China has worked hard to put loopholes, as Senator Cardin referred to, loopholes and exemptions to many of the North Korea sanctions at the United Nations Security Council. I mean, that seems to weigh the way that China is working. Uh, there is an exemption under uh, the UNSC Resolution 2270, allows North Korea to sell coal and iron ore. China continues to import North Korea's coal, iron, iron ore. So I'd ask, uh, Mr. Ambassador, what would be the impact of a complete ban on China's import of North Korea's coal, iron, and iron ore? And is the administration working to this end these, to get rid of these loopholes and exemptions? Yes, we are indeed working to address the problem of North Korean coal exports generally and specifically to China. Um, if in sanctions you follow the money, the money takes you to coal also takes you to some other sectors. But your question was to Cole, so I'll stick with that. Um, the most effective way would be, of course, to address, uh, address this through a new UNSCR, a, a new Security Council resolution. Uh, UNSCRs generally are the gold standard because they are universally accepted and legally binding. If that is not possible, there are other options. Uh, we can seek to convince Chinese individual companies that it would be in their own best interest to avoid dealing with the most suspect North Korean coal exporters. And our actions, the administration's actions on Monday, designating Chinese companies, demonstrates that Nothing is off limits, including this. I don't want to get more specific at this point, but the questions from you, from um, Chairman Gardner are, uh, and uh, Ranking Member Cardin are exactly the right ones, and it is, um, I take it as a good sign that those are the questions the administration is grappling with right now, actively. Let me ask a final question. I know time is expiring. According to the Congressional Research Service, this year alone, North Korea has conducted almost 30 missile tests. It's double the number of last year. What, what are we hearing from our friends in Japan and South Korea about what's happening over there? There is immense and appropriate concern in uh, Japan and in South Korea about the accelerating tempo of uh, North Korea's ballistic missile activity. Uh, and a commensurate willingness to work closely with the United States to promote uh, military interoperability, information sharing, uh, joint exercises, and a variety of other defense-related programs that are uh, increasing our ability to deter and to defend against this significant threat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Senator Menendez, and I want to thank Senator Menendez for his work on the legislation that uh, so much of this hearing is focusing on. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding the hearing, and I, I want to uh, commend you on uh, your active leadership in this regard, and, and we work together in the North Korea Sanctions and Policy Enhancement Act, and I appreciate that that's one of the vehicles that we are using to try to uh, push back against North Korea's not only promotion of its nuclear weaponry, but also my concern of proliferation as well. And I think all of my colleagues, from what I gathered as I was having meetings in my office but had the TV on, have asked the same questions. What is it that we get, we need to do to get China? And I must say that one of the things I'm convinced that we're unwilling to do, and it's from my experience uh, as one of the authors of the Iran Sanctions Act, is to sanction the universe of financial transactions because those would lead to Chinese banks. And when we do that, that had some of the toughest and most consequential actions on Iran. Now, we have not pursued uh, the financial transaction center uh, as an element of getting those who want to facilitate North Korea's actions uh, and creating pressure on them uh, as the world created pressure on Iran from disengaging with it financially. So Ambassador Freed, have, have we, meaning the administration, contemplated the type of financial sanctions that we levied against Iran as it relates to those who would be doing business with North Korea? and? who would be permitting them access to their banking centers? We are looking at all possible points of leverage and pressure against North Korea and the North Korean economy. We have abundant tools. You're quite right that the financial sanctions against Iran combined with the, um, the oil and gas sanctions were powerful. So that there's no question about that. But are we specific? It's, I didn't ask you about all tools. I'm asking specifically about these tools. It seems to me that we are reticent to pursue the type of financial transactions because they would largely lead to Chinese banks. And so in the absence of doing that, one of the most powerful tools that you might have left to get North Korea to observe international norms uh, and the will of the international community, as expressed by the United Nations, is missing. Why is it that the administration has not come forward and sought specifically that type of either tool or implement it if they think they have the power to do so themselves? We actually have uh, sanctioned, we have designated a number of North Korean banks. The, we are now and the action which the administration took on Monday demonstrates that we are willing to take the next step of designating um, third country entities which are cooperating with designated North Korean, uh, North Korean banks. So we have crossed that line and we are actively looking and constantly looking at additional targets. Which so, North Korean banks, I mean which Chinese banks have you sanctioned? Well, this Monday. There were um, Chinese financial institutions uh, sanctioned by the Treasury Department. And I think you've got there's four Chinese nationals and one uh, entity complicit in sanctions evasion. Uh, nationals is good, but I'm talking about institutions. And, the, and an institution. This was a well, financial I, I'd, I'd like to know whether you have all the authorities you need to go after Chinese banks that are engaged in dealing with the financial transactions that North Korea would ultimately need. Because it seems to me that if we are going after those banks, uh, that that is an incredibly powerful tool. So if you, can, if you can just explicitly tell me, do you have all the authorities that you need? And if so, is it the intention of the administration to use those authorities against whatever bank, whether they be Chinese or others, as it relates to transactions with North Korea? Yes, we believe we have the authorities we need, and yes, we are looking at, at all possible uh, pressure points, including 
financial. So if that's the case, then the onus is on the administration, not on Congress, to provide you additional authorities that uh, you obviously don't need based upon your answer. Let me ask one other question. One of my main concerns is North Korea's level, and Mr. Secretary, maybe you could speak to this, about sharing and transferring nuclear technology. Uh, North Korea has successfully subverted sanctions and export and import controls, often through falsely flagging cargo ships. Uh, I, I want to get a sense from you uh, what steps are we taking, what steps are international partners taking uh, since March to more rigorously monitor and ensure that all countries are complying with the stricter controls the UN Security Council passed in March. I, uh, Senator, I'd go one step further than merely the UN Security Council resolution that uh, because proliferation is a paramount concern of the Obama administration, uh, we are working through a variety of intelligence and law enforcement channels uh, to significantly enhance the monitoring of uh, DPRK activities to establish telltales and, and uh, tripwires uh, for the purpose of making it harder and harder for the DPRK to successfully uh, sell or transfer either technology or fissile material and to try to ensure that we're able to detect efforts uh, they may undertake to do that. That involves uh, close cooperation not only with uh, North Korea's neighbors but also ensuring that uh, it is constrained in terms of its ability to move uh, ships, cargo, planes, and people. So increased scrutiny at international airports, uh, greater verification of passport information, the requirement of visas, uh, as well as close government-to-government uh, -government information sharing are among the steps that we're taking. If I could add, Senator, to your important point about China, um, we are working our way through the suite of uh, options in terms of steps that we can take vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China's behavior towards North Korea. We're be we've begun, obviously, with the goal of persuading China to take more and more action, in part because China w can do far more effectively and usefully, from our point of view, willingly, uh, than we can achieve indirectly through direct sanctions against China. But we have, as my colleague Dan Fried mentioned, not uh, balked at taking direct action against Chinese entities or people when the evidence is there. We make a point of bringing information to the Chinese and encouraging the Chinese to uh, act on that information and to develop it further in their own law enforcement and security channels. They have abundant tools of their own to put restrictions on uh, the DPRK. I'm not in the business of defending China. We think that there is much more that they need to do. As I mentioned, President Obama stood up in China and made that point directly and explicitly in public, as he has in private. But the fact is that the, the trend line of uh, Chinese action against DPRK proliferation, missile and nuclear activities, and the trend line of China's cooperation with the international community, generally through the UN and with the United States on a bilateral basis, is improving. Senator Rubio. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Freed, I'm going to talk about this report, the recent study by the Center for Advanced Defense Studies. It's called In China's Shadow. And uh, basically, it's clear from this report that China has allowed a Chinese company and its front company to conduct about $532 million in trade volume. The report identifies six companies. You discussed here the sanctions against one. Why did the Treasury only designate one of those six companies? We are actively looking at all possible targets. I won't speak for Treasury and its individual decisions, but in my experience, Treasury is both effective and aggressive in identifying targets and pursuing them. We have to have sufficient evidence to meet Treasury's legal threshold, but I will tell you that we are in the mode 
of gathering information, and we'll go where the information takes us. I, I don't know. I don't want to get in. I, I don't no, but want that to, just sounds like talk. I mean, I, I get it. The, you're saying. I don't want to talk about a specific company and a specific designation, at least in this session. Why? They're out there in this report. I mean, they're named. Uh, the world, everyone, uh, everyone knows who these companies are. There's not a mystery here. Well, in a, as a general rule, it's best not to talk about um, current investigations and future That's true in a court of law and in an after but, but <laughs> In an open session. No, that's absurd. This is, this is an open reported, this is a report that's out there for the world to see. Everyone knows this. This well, is not a secret. I'll tell and, you what, I can get, I will consult with my Treasury colleagues and try to get you whatever yeah. we can. And that's why these hearings often, I mean, are just so hard to sit through sometimes because you just get all this, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, I know you're towing the company line or whatever, the Department, the Secretary of State's line on this stuff, but I think everyone can see what this is. I mean, we are afraid to press the case against too many Chinese companies because of the broader situation between China and the United States. Let me ask you for the record. The, the, has the White House or the State Department ever pressured the Justice Department or Treasury to delay designations and law enforcement actions to ava avoid embarrassing China? Not to my knowledge, no, sir. Okay. Because we have a Department of Justice indictment that was unsealed in civil forfeiture actions, the criminal indictment lists transactions and millions of U.S. dollars going all the way back to 2009 where there's these front companies that served as financial intermediaries for U.S. dollar transactions between North Korean-based entities who were being financed by KKBC, which is a designated North Korean bank, and suppliers in other countries. And it was done in order to evade restrictions on U.S. dollar transactions. And I don't understand. Why did we wait from 2009 to 2016? Why did we wait to act against these persons? And the only conclusion one could draw is that beyond the issue of sanctions, we have here the issue of pressure because of the broader uh, situation with China and our foreign policy. And I got to be frank, this just looks to me like an administration that's saying, let's not go too hard on some of these Chinese companies because it's going to destabilize our broader relationship with China on a series of other topics. And that's what it looks like. Here's another point that I don't understand. There are three times as many Iran-related persons designated by the United States than North Korea-related persons. Uh, can anyone describe for me the reason for this discrepancy? I have no problem with there being a lot of Iran-related designations, but why are there so many more Iran-related designations than North Korean-related designations, when in fact North Korea has already not only developed weapons, but are demonstrating it and, 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 and using them in all sorts of tests? Why the discrepancy? First point to make is that the administration's action on Monday to designate the Chinese banks was an important step. And as I said earlier in the hearings, we are actively looking at a number of targets. With respect to the numbers and comparing Iran and, Co and North Korea, the Iranian economy is both much larger and much more connected to the rest of the world than the North Korean economy. And the North Korean economy was despite huge areas that are hidden behind the various walls of secrecy in Iran, is generally more open. Uh, that may have something to do with the numbers. But to answer what I think, Senator, is your larger point, the administration shares Congress's view that the North Korean threat and North Korean actions, including especially the recent nuclear tests, compels us to intensify our pressure campaign, working both through the UN with third countries such as the Japanese, South, South Koreans, Europeans, Australians, Canadians, and using our national authorities in a coordinated fashion to increase the pressure. Um, we welcomed the legislation earlier this year. We've put it to good use and we intend to pursue North Korean targets aggressively. All I can say is that what this looks like from watching it is that what we're basically involved in here is a provocation response cycle with, with North Korea. And, and you talk about the sanctions from when I know my time is up, and you talk about the bill that Congress passed earlier this year that we passed this year, but it was un only until then it was that, uh, that we finally designated North Korea as a primary money laundering concern. And um, again, this whole thing looks like, to me, a combination of things. This provocation cycle that we've gotten ourselves into in North Korea 
where the, you know, we're holding back on sanctions to enable to use them if they provoke us in a different setting. And the cycle continues. North Koreans have played this brilliantly over the last few years, uh, buying time for themselves to reach the point they've reached. And the other is, quite frankly, what this looks like is that the United States is trying to, it's holding its uh, diplomatic fire and its sanctions fire on some of these issues for fear of impacting our relationship with China. Um, and, and in our fear of uh, offending the Chinese government or going after some of their entities, who, by the way, are also involved in all sorts, some, all sorts of other endeavors that uh, are questionable. So, again, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I don't know why it's taken so long and why so little has been done, and it's, uh, it, uh, it's no surprise we're at the point we're at today. Um, one, just one point, Senator. You mentioned the, my words, not yours, the trap of the provocation response cycle. That is not where we are, that's not what we're doing. This year especially, working through the UN and other channels, we are in a position of intensifying pressure independent of a provocation response cycle. We intend, we are in earnest, we intend to increase pressure on North Korea to do so, we also have to work around the world with third countries and with the Chinese, as my colleague pointed out. That is our intention. So I agree that a provocation response cycle and, be, and staying within such a cycle would not be the right approach, and that is not our approach. Mr. Chairman, with your permission, if I would just add, Senator Rubio, that um, if it were the administration's policy to tiptoe around China in dealing with uh, the North Korean threat. We would never have decided with the Republic of Korea to deploy the THAAD system. We would never have designated a Chinese entity and Chinese national. Uh, we would never have taken uh, the decision to send a B-1 uh, bomber or uh, aircraft carrier uh, to the Korean Peninsula. It is very much the case that we seek active Chinese cooperation. We recognize that a change in China's behavior is a prerequisite to getting a change in North Korea's behavior. And the President, the Secretary of State, and others have made crystal clear directly in private to Chinese leaders and in public uh, that we think there is much more that China needs to do and can do and should do to tighten the screws on the DPRK given their significant leverage and their special relationship. And, and all those moves are important, but I'm talking, we're talking about sanctions here. And yes, we sanctioned one company. There are multiple companies affiliated with, from China, China-related uh, companies, who we have just as much evidence against. Everybody knows. I mean, everyone knows who they are. And when you look at how long it's taken to get to this point, and you look at the limitations that have been placed where only one company has been designated so far, when there are multiple companies of equal status and some actually are involved in even more of these sorts of deals, it starts to look like we're, we're trying to not do too much too soon. And this notion of a standard of proof, um, yeah, I understand about that if you're going to prosecute someone in federal court. But from this perspective, this is a very different situation. This is not, this is an, not even a secret. The world knows who these companies are. And quite frankly, they don't necessarily take great uh, steps to try to hide it in many occasions because the interest of the Chinese government ultimately, beyond anything else, is stability in North Korea. They don't want to see a regime collapse and millions of people pouring over the border, and in addition to a profit motive that's involved here as well for, for some of these companies. We know who these companies are. We haven't moved fast enough on it. There's no reason not to have moved faster. There's plenty of targets of opportunity and plenty of information out there about them. And, and thank you, Senator Rubio. And I just re remind uh, Secretary Russell and the administration that under the Sanctions Act that we passed, these are mandatory investigations required and mandatory sanctions required unless the administration provides a waiver to Congress. And at this point, do you intend to provide us with waivers of companies that you're investigating? No. And so why have we only designated one company then? The, as I said earlier, tre the Treasury Department, the State Department, and our intelligence community are all involved, engaged in investigations. As, my co as Assistant Secretary Russell said, of course the preferred 
option is for China itself to do more as we think it should. A second option is to have Chinese companies independently come to the conclusion that it would be a lot better for them if they avoided interaction with North Korean companies. But clearly, our actions on Monday indicate that we are willing to sanction Chinese companies who are evading UN or US sanctions. So we are pursuing all of these avenues. Senator Markey. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman, very much. Um, we know that uh, Kim Jong-un's uh, goal is to die as a very old man in his bed. So uh, that doesn't really work for him if there's an all-out nuclear war uh, in that region because he would probably uh, not become a very old man. And so my uh, concern here is the plans which are in place to use preemptive force against North Korea's nuclear arsenal or its leadership, which could actually increase the risk of accidental nuclear war in a crisis. Recently, South Korea's defense minister informed the parliament that South Korea has forces on standby that are ready to assassinate Kim Jong-un if South Korea feels threatened by nuclear weapons. He said this, South Korea has a plan to use precision missile capabilities to target the enemy's facilities in major areas as well as eliminating the enemy's leadership. If North Korea fears that South Korea intends to use preemptive force to kill its leaders, then that could create huge pressures for Kim to delegate control over his nuclear weapons to frontline military commanders. And if North Korea believes that South Korea plans to preemptively take out its nuclear weapons, that could create pressure to use them or lose them in a crisis. Both of these pressures could drastically increase the risk of inadvertent nuclear war on the peninsula. Secretary Russell, in your view, is there a risk that military plans focused on preemptive attacks on North Korea's leadership and its nuclear arsenal uh, could increase the risk of uncontrolled nuclear escalation? As part of your strategy for managing the North Korean nuclear threat, is the administration working on plans to de-escalate a military crisis so that it does not spiral out of control and result in a nuclear war? And do you foresee potential arrangements for crisis communications with the North Korean regime to defuse and de-escalate such a situation that could lead to an accidental nuclear war? The short answer, Senator Markey, is yes, we are uh, concerned lest there be an escalatory cycle uh, on the Korean Peninsula. Yes, uh, we have in place uh, very serious counter-escalation plans in the U.S. ROK alliance. The commander of uh, the combined forces, uh, General Vince Brooks, one of America's uh, best soldiers, uh, is, as his predecessors have been, uh, working with the ROK military and national uh, leadership on a, a day in and day out basis. They're very tightly stitched together. And yes, uh, the alliance has very specific plans uh, to deal with a variety of contingencies uh, with a view to, in the first instance, uh, de-escalating and defusing uh, this has been a big part of our joint uh, defense strategy. Now, there's a lot of uh, hyperbole and rhetoric uh, in the way that uh, certainly North Korea speaks always uh, and the way that some South Korean officials occasionally uh, speak when they're either testifying or speaking before the press. I don't think that uh, the uh, comments of the defense minister uh, taken by themselves represent an intent on the part of the Republic of Korea to take precipitant or provocative action. As far as the North my concern obviously is how um, the North Koreans react to it, whether or not 
South Korea intends on doing is separate from the paranoia that's induced in an individual or a group of people that could then lead to an escalation. That's what we were always concerned about during the Cold War between the U.S. and USSR. It was an escalation of rhetoric that then could be used, uh, unfortunately, by those that would think that nuclear weapons are usable. And so that's always a concern. And what we're seeing, actually, in following the 2013 North Korea nuclear test, a poll found that 66 percent of the South Korean public favored acquiring an independent nuclear deterrent. After North Korea's test in January of this year, uh, uh, Won Yu Chul, a senior South Korean figure in President Park's party, suggested that South Korea should acquire its own nuclear weapons, uh, referring to our nuclear umbrella that we provide. Won said, quote, we can't borrow umbrellas from next door every time it rains. We should wear a raincoat of our own. We should get our own nuclear weapons. How would you assess pressures in South Korean society to acquire nuclear weapons? How would you assess uh, pressure inside of the Japanese society for them to um, acquire nuclear weapons? And what actions are we taking uh, to reduce the likelihood that they move in that direction? Senator, I think that the uh, pressure in the mainstream of political society in either the Republic of Korea or in Japan to contemplate the acquisition of nuclear weapons is directly commensurate with their faith in America's uh, commitment as an ally uh, to their defense uh, and to the extended deterrence or the uh, nuclear umbrella provided by their alliance with the United States. I think as long as so, so you're saying they would have to believe that if there was, for example, a nuclear attack on South Korea, that we would then um, launch a nuclear attack on North Korea. They would have to believe that. If I put it the other way, Senator, if the Japanese and the Korean publics and their leaders lost faith in America's resolve, in our absolute determination to use all of the uh, tools of uh, national security to deter and to uh, defend against an attack from North Korea, then yes, I think the so what this so, so how do you interpret action. this poll that says that sixty six percent of the South Korean public favors acquiring an independent nuclear deterrent? Does that not indicate to you that there's some increasing lack of confidence in the American nuclear umbrella that is that we would actually use <laughs> nuclear weapons? Uh, against North Korea if there was such an attack or, or even a biological attack on South Korea? Well, I can't speak to a particular poll. I think there's an ebb and flow among Korean, uh, among the Korean public. But certainly the concerns uh, driven by North Korea's uh, pattern of and tempo of uh, mm -hmm. testing is driving anxiety. However, uh, steps by the United States, such as the strong message of uh, reaffirmation of our alliance commitments that President Obama made in his immediate phone calls to both President Park and to Prime Minister Abe, the deployment of our strategic bombers uh, to the Korean Peninsula, uh, the plans for bilateral and trilateral exercises, uh, and the other manifestations of America's unshakable determination to defend and protect ourselves and our allies, I believe, uh, keeps that kind of thinking so you're still saying that off the So you're saying that we're sending strong signals that yes. we would use nuclear bombs on North Korea and that we're assuring the, the South Koreans that they don't have to have their own nuclear deterrent because we would use them in the event that there was a nuclear attack on South Korea. Is that what you're saying? No, Senator. What I'm saying is that we're giving enough confidence to our allies. Confidence that what? That, that we, we would do what? That that our deterrence, our that nuclear, our nuclear weapons, that our nuclear bombs, and that our our willingness to, to utilize use them, to use them the full range of right. U.S. That we would be. That's what I'm saying. That they, they, we are giving them confidence that we would use nuclear bombs 
against North Korea. Is that what you're saying? I'm, I'm not going to say. I leave it to the President to decide if and when the United States is going to use a nuclear weapon. What I'm saying is... But that's what I'm hearing you say. That's those exactly the words that you're using. You're, you're not saying nuclear bomb, but you're using every other word but that to describe the use of a nuclear bomb. The way that, Senator, that I think uh, it should be understood is that the certainty on the part of the DPRK that the United States would either prevent th their use of nuclear weapons or retaliate in a devastating manner is an effective deterrent, and the credibility of the U.S. deterrent is such that neither government intends to pursue nuclear I, I guess weapons. what I would say is we should really intensify our efforts to make sure that there's no accidental um, situation that develops that could increase attentions, uh, that we're working very closely, that we're creating close communications with the North Korean uh, government in terms of the deployment of their weapons so that we don't have that accident and we don't have to ever have to use a nuclear weapon ourselves uh, against uh, the North Koreans because we don't know where that would end. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Senator Udall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and, and thank you both for being here. Retired uh, Admiral Mullen and former Senator Sam Nunn recently made recommendations uh, with regard to how to deal with the threat from North Korea. These included many recommendations for how to get North Korea back to the negotiating table. How has the State Department reviewed these recommendations, and do you believe that it is possible to restart negotiations? Thank you, Senator. Um, I recently sat down with both Admiral Mullen, with whom I had previously worked when he was chairman and who I deeply admire, and Senator Nunn, uh, to work through in some detail uh, their recommendations in the report. Uh, I had been in touch with them during the process of writing the report, uh, as well as with other important members of the committee. I think that we uh, see things in a consistent, uh, generally consistent manner. The goal of the U.S. policy has been to try to engineer negotiations with North Korea over their nuclear program uh, on the simple grounds that that is the only uh, peaceful uh, way forward to achieve denuclearization. But the terms of those negotiations are very important. There's not only no value in talk for talk's sake, but the experience of the uh, first Bush uh, presidency, the uh, Clinton presidency, uh, the Bush 44 presidency, and our own experience has demonstrated that unless the negotiations are about North Korea's nuclear program, and unless they include the discussion of uh, IEA access and monitoring, North Korea simply can't be trusted to honor its promises. What the North Koreans have done is to, number one, abandon the six-party talks, renounce the commitments they've made under those talks, uh, reject and defy international law in the form of the UN Security Council uh, resolutions, and continue uh, their violations while uh, fitfully, occasionally offering to hold discussions with the United States about uh, the withdrawal of U.S. forces from South Korea. That's an utterly unacceptable basis for talks. But we have worked consistently to show the North Koreans that we want to negotiate, that we are willing to talk, that the door is open to a process that can net them uh, the benefits that were on the table in 2005 in the six-party talks process, which includes discussions about a successor agreement to an armistice. 
dip includes uh, the process of diplomatic normalization, economic assistance, and so on. And <coughs> Secretary Kerry has gone out of his way, both publicly but also in international meetings where the North Korean foreign minister was present, to emphasize our interest and willingness uh, to negotiate. Do you have any uh, additional comments on that? No. The, the, uh, how can we strengthen our monitoring capabilities to prevent North Korea from obtaining nuclear materials and equipment that it could use to create additional nuclear weapons? Does Congress need to invest more in technology and equipment to better monitor such transfers? Senator, monitoring the uh, materials that go into North Korea and that come out of North Korea, monitoring the movement of uh, DPRK scientists and officials who uh, ha might be involved in proliferation is a uh, top priority for our uh, national security agencies, uh, as it is for those of uh, Japan, Korea, and I believe uh, China. We're working to share information. We're working to tighten uh, the safeguards and the monitoring. Uh, as for what additional funding authorities or congressional action uh, would assist that effort, um, I would have to consult with my colleagues in other agencies. Uh, and propose they respond in a classified setting. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Udall. And we'll go to a second round of questioning. I'll begin with uh, Senator Menendez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ambassador Freed, I, I sort of like pride myself on my preparation for these hearings. So I went back to my office after your answer, and I looked at OFAC's uh, statement of Monday, you said in response to my question, we just sanctioned a bank on Monday. Well, I read from OFAC's uh, statement that they imposed sanctions on Dan Ong Yang Kwan Industrial Development Company and four individuals. Now, is that company a bank? Sir, it is a financial, it is not a bank, it is a f financial company that worked with a sanctioned North Korean bank. Oh, it's different than saying that you sanctioned a bank. Yes, sir. You did not sanction a bank on Monday. Uh, we sanctioned a, fi a Chinese uh, financial corporation. All right, well, it's so different than a bank. Let me ask yes, you sir. this. Uh, how many banks, banks has uh, the administration sanctioned as it relates to North Korea? Uh, a num do you mean banks in general or Chinese banks? Chinese. Let's talk about Chinese banks. A number, no Chinese banks. No Chinese banks. In, not in China. We uh -huh. have um, That's my point. A That's the point North that I was Korean trying to drive at earlier. You have sanctioned no Chinese banks at the end of the day, and they are probably the major financial institutions for North Korea. What what this company, as I understand, did was made purchases of sugar and fertilizer on behalf of a designated Korean bank. It's a trading company, not a financial company. So when I take testimony uh, uh, as a member of this committee, I need to make sure that testimony is accurate uh, because I make decisions based upon it. And I must say that the, the information you gave me is not accurate. This was not a bank. This is a trading company. And finally, I got the answer that I wanted to hear, which is what I knew, is that you sanctioned no Chinese banks as it relates to North Korea. And it is our hesitancy to do so that takes away one of the major instruments possible to change Chinese thinking. I, I'm all for persuasion if you can achieve it. But when you can't, and North Korea continues to advance its nuclear program in a way that becomes more menacing, and its miniaturization, and its missile technology, I don't know at what point we uh, are going to uh, continue to think that we can stop them when, in fact, w they're pretty well on their way, and we allow them to continue to do so. 
and we don't use some of the most significant tools that we have. So I'm disappointed that you didn't give me the right information. Uh, one final question to you, uh, Mr. Secretary. Uh, we had a, uh, I think the chairman had a, a separate private panel that suggested that the Chinese have basically created a preference over stability in the Korean Peninsula versus the challenge of North Korea pursuing um, uh, this nuclear power, nuclear weapons, and missile technology. Now, I'm never for a nuclear proliferation, but is that, do you agree that that is the view that China has? Senator, the, what uh, I've heard Xi Jinping say repeatedly is that China's three no's are no war, no chaos, and no nuclear weapons on the Korean Peninsula. So I think they have multiple objectives that are in conflict with each other. And we see, in part depending on North Korean behavior, in part depending on uh, the pressure or the persuasion uh, from the United States, uh, some ebbs and flows, some shifts in the Chinese from uh, a bias towards maintaining stability and preventing War and action. chaos are, in my mind, equally uh, uh, the same to some degree. When you have war, you generally have some degree of chaos. No nuclear weapons, because there are some who suggest that if that's their dynamic, then allowing uh, South Korea to pursue the possibility of nuclear power for nuclear weapons changes China dynamics as how far it's willing to push North Korea. I, I think that the Chinese are very uh, mindful of the risk that either South Korea or Japan uh, might distance itself from the U.S. Uh, nuclear umbrella and pursue their own capabilities. And that, uh, I believe, ought to motivate China to redouble its efforts to push back on the North Koreans. We, that's only one of many I examples of why uh, it, we believe it is so in the best interests of China to tighten up uh, on the North to expand their cooperation with us uh, and to really abandon an old pattern of tolerating uh, a significant amount of provocative and dangerous behavior by the DPRK. The greatest driver of instability in Northeast Asia is North Korea's nuclear and missile program. And the actions that the United States is taking and will take hand in hand with our allies that China uh, opposes, which China perceives as somehow containing it, are all driven by the growing threat from uh, the DPRK. Secretary Kerry has said again and again, if that threat diminishes, if that threat is eliminated, the rationale for the United States to take a more robust military posture in Northeast Asia goes with it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your courtesy. Thank you, Senator Menendez. And I want to follow up on Senator Menendez's question on, on this issue of, of banks. I believe in the testimony, and I'm trying to look at it in, into the testimony, perhaps you can just refresh my memory. Uh, the statement was made that North Korea is exporting about a billion dollars worth of coal to China that is benefiting the North Korean nuclear activity. Is that correct? Yes, that's our belief. Okay, yes. and so let's assume that a billion dollars is coming in from, give or take uh, uh, some, uh, is coming in to, uh, to North Korea from China for the purchase of coal that's benefiting the nuclear program. I assume they're using Chinese banks, is that correct, for this coal and the importation and the payment of that coal? The North Korean export of coal is certainly a large and the largest single, single generator of foreign currency for North, the North Korean economy generally. Um, it's a, a slightly different question as to whether that money directly funds its nuclear weapons and missile programs. However, for the purposes of our sanctions, um, that difference, and because money is fungible, that difference is not, is not dispositive. And so are they using Chinese banks? We are looking into 
exactly the mechanisms by which the coal goes from North Korea to China. I don't want to say specifically the role of banks versus the role of trading companies or other institutions, but we are looking hard and actively at the coal trade generally. Okay, so earlier in this conversation I asked if we were actively investigating Chinese entities. Yes. And Okay, so we are actively investigating Chinese yes. entities. So we can expect and should expect sanctions to be issued against a number of Chinese entities. Is that correct? And if that's not correct, then when will the administration be sending waivers to Congress? And you said earlier that we do not anticipate waivers to be issued. That's true. So when can we anticipate these additional sanctions the, to be made? As my colleague and I said, the best option, the most effective way to put sustained and sustainable pressure on North Korea, which is our objective here, is to have China itself decide for its own purposes that this is where it wants to go. A second way to proceed is to convince Chinese companies, including banks, that it would be in their best interest not to deal with sanctioned or sanctionable activities. The option of directly sanctioning Chinese entities is available. And mandatory, if they violate the terms of our legislation. Well, that's right. What we're looking at is the most effective means to achieve this end. What we want, the pur our purpose is to put pressure on North Korea. And the purpose of sanctions is to support a policy. Um, my colleague has spoken to the policy. I'm just the sanctions guy. The purpose of sanctions is pressure on North Korea. We want to find the best tactics to do that. We are looking at all of the tools. That includes sanctions. That includes high-level discussions with the Chinese. I look forward to being in touch with you, sir, with your committee about our thinking as this, as this progresses. But I can tell you that this is not a go through the motions exercise. We're serious about this in general and specifically with respect to coal. Well, let, then let me ask you this next question. Uh, has the administration designated any uh, actors, entities in North Korea for their cyber actions, cyber attacks against the United States? Not specifically for cyber. However, some of our designations are so broad, I suspect that they capture so do we, do we plan to issue any cyber sanctions under the terms of the Section 209 of the legislation, <coughs> the North Korea Sanctions Enhancement Act? Uh, Mr. Chairman, the administration did uh, levy sanctions against a number of North Korean individuals and uh, entities in the wake of the Sony hack under our own presidential executive order that preceded the adoption and the uh, signing of the North Korea Sanctions Act. We haven't yet uh, developed uh, a case uh, under the law uh, for against North Korean cyber actors, but we are working towards that end. And and we, there is no question that uh, North Korea's uh, cyber activities, both those that emanate directly from North Korea and from uh, servers in third countries, represent a serious threat to us and to others. We're on it. Because, I mean, as reported this summer, North Korean hackers steal blueprints for U.S. fighter jets. Have they been sanctioned under the legislation, these actors? The intelligence and the law enforcement community in in the U.S. government is looking at and seeking to develop uh, cases uh, in order to sanction 
North Korean actors for any transgression. Uh, you talked a little bit about Air Corio. Air Corio. Has the administration initiated investigations for designation of Air Corio uh, under the law? And does it believe it's engaged in activities that would make it eligible for designation? In this setting, Mr. Chairman, I don't want to discuss specific investigations. It is true that we and our allies have curtailed Air Corio's activities and restricted its ability. Well, third governments have restricted its ability to land. I don't want to discuss in this session, in an open session, particular investigations. But we are well aware of Air Corio's role in the North Korean system. Secretary Russell, uh, we talked earlier in the hearing about United Nations Security Council Resolutions 2270. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about China's implementation of 2270, particularly as it relates to coal? I'll make a general and Ambassador Fried may be, yeah, may be I'll appropriate. I'll make a general yeah. comment and turn it over to Ambassador Fried. The general comment is that I would characterize China's uh, implementation of uh, 2270 as incomplete, uh, as a mixed bag. Um, we have seen some uh, clear indications that China has strengthened uh, sanctions enforcement. That includes improved customs enforcement. Uh, the Chinese have publicly and privately uh, asserted unequivocally uh, that they consider themselves fully bound by the terms of uh, 2270. Uh, but as I've said repeatedly uh, and quoted President Obama and Secretary Kerry saying, uh, we think that there is uh, much more that they can do. Um, I've had quite a number of conversations with a variety of Chinese counterparts on this very subject, both in China and elsewhere. Um, they point out the not inconsiderable challenges that they face, given the uh, extent of the Chinese-North Korean border and the degree of commerce and their concern about uh, the livelihood and the welfare of uh, North Korean people, so, so they say. But right now, Mr. Chairman, I think our principal focus is the next generation of sanctions that uh, we're seeking to obtain through a new UN Security Council resolution in New York. And that includes um, making some adjustments to provisions under 2270 uh, to address some of the, the problems that you have flagged. And Ambassador Fried, before you answer the question, I think uh, in our briefing material given to every member of this committee, it talked about the China's announcement number 11, instructions to businesses on implementation of UN Security Council Resolution 2270. And it talked about the sample letter that a entity could provide to uh, the government to basically claim the livelihood exemption. Uh, and. Uh, basically says, my company is importing blank product. I hereby solemnly commit that this transaction is with no documentation required. So when it gets to the issue of the livelihood exemption, Ambassador Freed, the second United Nations Security Council resolution, what will it do to change China's behavior so that it can fully implement the sanctions and deprive the regime of foreign currency used to further develop its nuclear program? Your question, Mr. Chairman, is the right one, but because this involves negotiations in the UN with the Chinese, I can't predict where we will come out. But I will say this. Security Council resolutions are the gold standard in sanctions because they're universal, they have unchallenged legitimacy, and they are binding. But we are not bound by what the Security Council will accept. We have our national sanctions. We would prefer to see an UNSCR address this issue. If not, we have options. And we are develop as I've as I said earlier today, 
We are actively developing our options. And, and do those options involve actions at the United Nations? I mean, are there, are there options, I mean, compliance mechanisms within the United well, Nations to enforce? Cer certainly, sir. The, um, we work through the UN, the North Korea sanction, the, the UN North Korea Sanctions Committee. We work with them on a regular basis. Uh, this spring I spent a day with them in a very detailed session with experts from Treasury, State Department, other agencies. So certainly we do that. But we have to pursue all of the avenues. Well, I, I want to get into some of those other yes, avenues sir. here in just a second. But yes, does sir. that committee have the ability to determine what nations are and are not fully enforcing 2270? And have they made that determination? The Sanctions Committee does issues, does issue reports, and governments submit to that committee reports on their own implementation of 2270. Um, and what's the finding of that report in regards to the country that is responsible for 90 percent of North Korea's economy? I would say um, Assistant Secretary Russell summed that up um, pretty well. Um, a mixed picture, um, although far better in action than before, there is a way, there is a way to go. And so are there mechanisms within the United Nations to, compliance mechanisms, to enforce the resolution? And has the United States utilized those mechanisms, and do we intend to? We intend to use all avenues, including at the UN, including the Sanctions Committee, um, to work to identify sanctionable activity, to use this to improve everyone's enforcement, well, first, recognition of the provisions of 2270 and the enforcement of it. So, certainly. And could you address some of the other options that you referred to in your answer? Certainly. Um, What I said earlier about convincing Chinese companies that it is in their best interest to avoid sanctionable activity is, some, is not just a phrase. Um, our actions on Monday indicate the Chinese companies, you know, the, the financial company and the individuals, the Chinese persons, physic, fiscal, legal and physical are not off limits. That news will spread around the Chinese community. We can also use various means to um, get the word out to Chinese businesses and banks that we are serious. The Congress has given us, and we have given ourselves under IEPA, wide authorities to act against sanctionable activity. The best sanctions are those that don't have to be used because the activity stops. The purpose of sanctions is not to punish but to change behavior. If sanctions serve their purpose and behavior changes, to be specific, the exports of coal diminish because the costs and risks of doing so increase, so much the better. But the credibility of that kind of a message will grow as our determination becomes apparent. When the Congress and the executive branch are pointed in the same direction, we are at our most powerful which is why the legislation is so useful to us. We intend in the coming weeks and in the life of this administration to pursue all of these avenues with the objective of squeezing the North Korean economy in the service of the political objective that my colleague laid out. Mr. Chairman, if I could add, in addition to uh, coal, North Korea has other uh, revenue streams that uh, we target. Uh, an important one is overseas labor, the export of uh, workers both in restaurants and in uh, 
forestry and agriculture, et cetera, which uh, generates significant uh, revenue for the country and for the, for the regime. Um, we have under our executive orders the authority to target uh, North Korea's export of labor on a unilateral basis. And we also have launched a worldwide effort to persuade uh, recipient countries, contracting co countries and companies uh, to end this practice and to forego the use of North Korean labor. We've had some successes. Uh, the media has also covered uh, the defection of some of the uh, North Korean restaurant workers, which has forced the North Koreans to double down on their uh, security restrictions and limit uh, themselves and who they send and how many they send. Um, this is another area where we are uh, continuing uh, to work to close off a revenue stream. And, and what more can be done on the, the human trafficking, labor trafficking uh, front? I think that's a very serious issue that uh, a number of countries are involved in, uh, mm -hmm. perhaps unwittingly, but most likely knowingly. Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, what more can the United States do? And do you need additional? You have all the authorities that we need through UN as well as uh, U.S. law to, to intercede. Um, Senator, a number of countries are sensitive to this issue, and when a light is shined on it, they have reacted well. So we and our um, and Treasury, State Department and Treasury colleagues have been going around to third country governments. Um, we are working with third, uh, with third governments about this. We also intend to pursue this with the Chinese and the Russians because they are significant importers of North Korean labor. Mm -hmm. So we are prepared to advance this issue just as my colleague said. We have the authorities we need, but since you, Mr. Chairman, you asked, it would be useful, I think, if um, you were sending similar messages. And we're happy to, uh, to stay in touch about this. Sending messages to third, third, countries. third countries about their, uh, huh. I think we've made it very exactly. clear uh, through, through our uh, actions in this committee that, uh, that we condemn any such activity, particularly at the access of the abuse that those workers uh, encounter abroad, as well as the contribution that they are, uh, again, uh, unintentionally providing to the North Korean regime and its ballistic missile program through work abroad, uh, two-thirds of their wages then or more being utilized right. by the government of North Korea. I couldn't agree more, sir, and um, it is, as I said, enormously helpful when the executive branch and the Congress are pointed in the same direction. Um, do you believe you need additional um, authorities or, or? I don't think we need additional authorities. Um, we, need to, we need to continue work with potentially cooperative third governments, and that's what we're doing. And we, we are working, of course, closely with the Japanese and South Koreans to approach other governments. Um, and we are working through the issue of Chinese and Russian imports of labor, particularly Chinese. So China, Russia, uh, what other allies, though, do we have a close working relationship that need to hear that message from Congress? Well, there are governments in um, the Middle East uh, and a couple in Europe, but they have all, uh, some of them have started taking action already, partly because they were responsive to our concerns and I believe yours. Mm -hmm. um, the issue of labor, has it extended into other restaurants you talked about? Has it extended into other fields that perhaps we are worried about from other uh, considerations? We believe so. Um, we, are, we are looking into the details of the use of North Korean labor. And I don't want to dis – some of this is classified, and I'm happy to discuss it in another, uh, in another setting. But there, as we discover in specific information, we may have opportunities to approach both governments and mm, – companies. Thank you. Uh, 
Could you elaborate further a little bit on any ongoing or previous cooperation between North Korea and Iran and their ballistic missile programs? Well, Mr. Chairman, we monitor and review all uh, information, open source and intelligence information on uh, potential WMD activities and cooperation by uh, both North Korea and Iran and definitely uh, any potential nexus uh, whereby either would seek to acquire proliferation sensitive information or materials from uh, the others. Um, as you know well, um, the UN Security Council Resolution 2231 prohibits the sale or transfer to or, or from Iran of ballistic missiles and related, uh, related items. Um, we have unilateral and other multilateral sanctions against that. Uh, so um, w please rest assured that uh, this is a focus of intense uh, scrutiny on the part of U.S. national security agencies. So at this point, we don't believe there is any cooperation between Iran and North Korea on their ballistic missile program. Mr. Chairman, I think any deeper uh, dive into this question should be done in a classified setting. But I'm, I myself am not aware of any uh, evidence of uh, cooperation uh, currently on uh, nuclear or missile programs. Ambassador Freed, do you wish to answer that? Um, there may be a closed session would be would be a better place to discuss the past um, relationship between North Korea and Iran and our current projections. Uh, the new government in Burma, um, the cooperation between possible North Korean activities, uh, the new government in Burma, how has that changed? Uh, there is not a change in terms of cooperation with the government of Burma on uh, the DPRK dealings uh, or to the extent that there is a change, it's for the better. The problem continues to be the gap between the government and the North, the Burmese military. And for that reason, uh, when the, the de facto leader of uh, Burma or Myanmar, Aung San Suu Kyi, was in Washington uh, just two weeks ago, uh, the U.S. senior officials, including the president, uh, underscored the importance of her and the duly elected civilian government uh, working with the uh, Burmese military uh, to root out and to stop any vestiges of uh, cooperation that may have uh, remained. We also uh, talked directly to the Burmese uh, military leadership about the DPRK. Uh, I myself have met with the commander in chief during my visits to uh, Burma as have uh, several of my colleagues and our talented ambassador Scott Marcial uh, has met with him as well. Um, we think that uh, there are pro potentially a few residual pockets of uh, within the Burmese military of people who uh, might still have some ongoing interactions, uh, but we are uh, ongoing interactions with with the, the DPRK, military with the DPRK, with the DPRK um, that in effect leftovers from uh, five plus years ago, the era of the military dictatorship. Um, but we think that as far as the <coughs> government is concerned and the military leadership is concerned, that they are fully on board and this is something that they are working to 
prevent and eradicate. I know that the conversations that we've had, though, with Burma recently, of course, talk about lifting of sanctions, mm -hmm. uh, the U.S. lifting of sanctions. Now, if yeah. they are still interacting or doing business with North Korea, that would be a violation of these sanctions. Right. Any, any uh, actor in Burma uh, found to be doing business with uh, the North Korean military would be in violation both of our executive orders and legislation and of the UN Security Council resolutions and would be subject to sanctions. I believe that the government and the military leadership in Burma is firmly opposed uh, to any of uh, that activity and is actively seeking to uh, ascertain whether any continues and if so to stop it. Thank you. And I, I want to stick with the subject of, of Burma here as we close out the hearing. Um, during, as you'll recall, Secretary Russell, during the confirmation of Ambassador Marcial that you just mentioned uh, to be Ambassador to Burma, I asked and received a letter from the State Department. Stated in part, the letter from the State Department stated that, and I quote, the Department is committed to full, robust, and timely consultation with you and your staff regarding U.S. policy toward Burma in general and sanctions policy in particular. Uh, on September 14th, while Burma leader Aung San Suu Kyi was visiting Washington, President Obama announced that he will terminate the national emergency with regard to, uh, with regard to Burma and lift the remaining U.S. sanctions on the country. It was claimed this action was closely coordinated with Aung San Suu Kyi and approved by her as well. Uh, can you describe the time frame, the extent of the congressional consultation with regard to lifting those sanctions on Burma? My, my deputy and my staff, uh, Mr. Chairman, including uh, during the period where I was traveling overseas, uh, met with members of the committee staff uh, and other Senate and House uh, staff uh, to describe the trend line in our thinking in the run-up to uh, Aung San Suu Kyi's visit. Um, the actual decision uh, by the President uh, to uh, lift the state of uh, national emergency, the AIPA uh, sanctions on uh, Burma was made within a, a day or a couple of days of the arrival of Aung San Suu Kyi. Once I, and it was subject to confirmation that uh, that indeed was her request. A couple of days, or maybe a day or so, as soon as I learned about this, you'll recall, um, I uh, put in a phone call to you personally uh, in an effort to fulfill both that obligation, but also in light of uh, the good cooperation that, uh, that we've had uh, to let you know uh, where it was heading. And the morning of Aung San Suu Kyi's uh, meeting with President Obama, uh, she attended a uh, breakfast meeting hosted by Vice President Biden uh, with uh, Senator Corker, uh, the chairman of the full committee, and uh, the Senate Majority Leader, uh, Leader McConnell, and other members, in which they asked her very directly uh, if she wanted the sanctions lifted, and she said yes. So on that basis, uh, in the subsequent meeting in the Oval Office, uh, President Obama announced, after confirming it with her personally, announced to the press his intention to lift sanctions. Do you feel the State Department met the full, robust, and timely standard pledge to this committee? Well, Mr. Chairman, what really matters is whether you feel it, uh, and if you don't, uh, I'll promise to do better, but it is my firm intent and desire to be uh, responsive and open in uh, sharing with you our policy, our thinking, uh, and to ensure that there's an opportunity to consult with you and to take your views into account. Well, I don't think breakfast and a phone call are full, robust, and timely. Do you support retaining sanctions on Burma military-controlled entities, MEC and MEHL, which uh, Aung San Suu Kyi herself said she supports? Well, what I heard her say 
uh, Mr. Chairman, is that the time has come to lift all the sanctions and for the United States not to serve as a prop for Burma, uh, but to be a supporter of the civilian government's uh, exercise of authority over the military. Um, so what we seek to do is to ensure that our programs and uh, policies reinforce the uh, the restrictions uh, on investment and on business, the controls and the regulations pertaining to business activities by the military and by MEC and Mel well, specifically that the Burmese government chooses to put in place. Let me just cut through that. So you support continuing the sanctions on these military controlled entities? No, I, I support uh, finding practical ways that we can continue to uh, discourage uh, irresponsible investment and business activities with entities like MEC and MEL, but to do so in support of the government of Burma's own policies. And they're in the process now of making decisions uh, in that regard. Thank you very much, Ambassador Freed, Secretary Russell. I appreciate your time uh, today. Uh, with the thanks to the committee providing us testimony and responses today, information to the members, the record will remain open until the close of business this Friday, September 30th, including for members to submit questions for the record. We ask the witnesses to respond as promptly as possible. Your responses will also be part of the made part of the record. Uh, I thank you very much for your service, and thank you for the opportunity to be before the committee today. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, sir.